Lady Kate, what an honour. It's been possibly months that we've been trying to do this. Um, I think I first reached out to Kate probably midway through last year. I was like, please, can we have a podcast? It's like, like I'm really busy. You said you said yes, and then and then and then we both. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're both not, not uh, that amazing at planning, so, but it's an <laughs> honour to chat to you now. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we made it. Yeah, congratulations. I feel happy for us both. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, and Kate is, is the most remarkable copywriter and we met actually through um, Vicky. Good old Vicky. She's lovely, yeah. isn't she? We met through Vicky Ross, who is amazing and helped us make the Canline copywriting course that we made. And you very kindly helped us on that. And your videos are some of the videos that people email us about the most and say that Kate team person is amazing. And uh, oh. so hopefully you've got you've got lots of uh, new fans from uh, around the world. So th thank you. And your lesson was hilarious as well. I think you talked about um, was it wee wees? Wee wees, yeah. It's one of my classes. The wee wee test. Not having too much copy about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I just like to wee wee. Yeah, so it's um, I love that and so much, and it was just so simple. And I think we've actually started using it more in our own, in my own life, and in our own work life now. Whenever I see a piece of copy, I always remember about your wee wee story, and I'm like, has, has it got the word you in it? <laughs> I think, uh, make people say you all the time it makes a lot of sense. But um, yeah, Kate, I mean, how you've obviously got an English accent, but you're definitely not in the UK. Um, Tell me, how did how did this happen? How did you get from, from the UK to Australia? Well, I was in the UK till about 25, um, you know, doing various jobs in digital marketing and things like that, when digital marketing was just, you know, in its nascent stages, it just begun in the UK. Um, and then a friend of mine wanted to go backpacking. So the intention really was to go backpacking around Asia. But my friend fell in love with a Thai boy called Bang um, on a beach. Uh, in, yeah, great name. Um, bang by name, bang by nature, by all accounts. So he, uh, that was in Pyongyang, and I was suddenly bereft of a friend. And to be honest, not a much experienced traveller. The furthest we went when I was a child, child was was Wales. So I, I was terrified to be honest, and I hot footed it straight to Australia, where I had a one friend. Um, and then two weeks later, I got a job because I ran out of money, you know. Um, and so I got a job, and the job happened to be as kind of head of digital at Ogilvy, who had just started their digital department. Little did they know that I was very underqualified. I got demoted and demoted as time went on as they realized I was not capable of such a role. But then, yes, I was in Australia. I did that role for about three years. They were very kind enough to sponsor me, um, uh, which then, as soon as they did, I left. <laughs> Great, you know, what a millennial. I came back to the UK for a few years, realized the horror of the UK and, and the weather, and then came back to Australia. We were talking about this just before the podcast. It was like coming back out of Narnia. It was like Australia had never existed. And then um, it took me about four years to sort myself out and come back to Australia. And I've been here ever since. Wow. It, the thing that is so nuts about that is when I moved to South Africa, I moved and started working in digital marketing for Ogilvy in South Africa. No way! <laughs> And they sponsored my visa. <laughs> yeah, well, we, you know, we both owe Ogilvy a debt. I really do. Hundred um, no, percent. I mean, I, I love, I love that agency, and I know. Um, I mean, the work from the the Sydney office has has always been really good as well. Um, yeah, it's a different vibe. O Ogilvy was part owned by a man called John Singleton over here, who's a real Aussie yeah. kind of battler, and he was very practical about advertising like there was no subtlety to the advertising it'd be like here's a beer it tastes like beer that would be a classic <laughs> ad here and there was we weren't allowed to enter awards so kind of that kind of creative kind of creativity that kind of snark that wit that you get to advertising in maybe yeah. the UK it yeah. wasn't here in Australia it was very practical but it was still a great experience it was an amazing place to work yeah no, it's, um, and I, I, I don't know about you but I always found that Ogilvy people tend to be you tend to find some of the characters in different Ogilvy offices around the world oh, yeah. I, um, yeah. I found that, that quite nice 
Yeah. I think Mostly working in, in a good way. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. There's some bad ways too. I think working in an advertising agency is honestly like it's a baptism of fire. Like, you know, the characters, the personalities, the huge egos you have to deal with. Um, okay. You know, it was terrifying, to be honest. And I'm glad that I'm no longer in advertising life and I work for myself. Um, but, um, I never quite felt like I fitted in, to be honest, but I enjoyed it. Yeah, well, I think that's possibly a a common thing where people don't feel like they quite fit in. But I think you touched on something that was interesting there. I do think a positive that you get from advertising with that baptism of fire is often, particularly if you're at a big agency, you end up having to learn a lot about a lot quite quite quickly. And I, do you feel that perhaps would have given you some extra confidence to go out on your own and do your own thing? Because I mean, I guess that's the next question: is how did you? Yeah. How did you start the, the empire that you have now? Um... Quite by accident, to be honest. So I worked there and then I worked obviously at places in the UK, came back and did contract roles. Um, you know, I was obviously had a bit more experience under my belt. So I was going into agencies being contractor. I briefly was a digital manager of an agency. I was on the board and had shares. It was absolutely hideous. So I kind of enjoyed the contracting life. Um, and then, you know, I was at that stage where I wanted to have a family. Uh, we were actually told we couldn't have kids. Um, we would have to do IVF. So it was all going to, that wasn't maybe going to happen for me. Mm -hmm. And then quite by chance, I got randomly pregnant. I, I blame my dog. The dog is not the father, but I got <laughs> a dog. And immediately after getting the dog, I got pregnant. Um, and then several other people who looked after my dog also got pregnant. So I think he's a fertility dog. Wow. Um, <laughs> random, it's like, you know what I'm like, Chris, I'm just going to go on off on a little tangent. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Got pregnant, um, was contracting, so no maternity leave. I had no savings, really. I was the primary breadwinner. So at about five months pregnant, I, I left the agency I was working at, and I was like, I got to do something. And I set up katetune.com, hideous website. I had flames up the side, flames, black website with red copy. What, what some kind of satanic thing going on there. Um, and I just did everything and anything to begin with, a bit of project management, because I was actually a producer and a project manager in agency world, more than a copywriter. I did have a brief stint and did everything and anything to get, get started. But yes, back to your actual question, you know, the Ogilvy stuff, just being able to pump out the work on a deadline, to not have to sit there and wait for inspiration, that, that, that you know, we always had to time sheet everything. Every minute of our day had to be recorded against the client. So that discipline of managing my time and then the project management skills of managing budgets and also to be honest managing people I think being a good successful freelance copywriter is 50% of writing and 50% dealing with clients you know they probably won't even remember the copy you wrote but they will remember the relationship so having learned to be a diplomat was hugely helpful in my freelance copywriting business. Uh, I imagine were, were there any books or people that you met or that sort of key bits of advice that you learned quite early on that really helped you? Or was it just kind of you picked it up as you went along? I must admit, I'm not a huge business book reader. You know, I'm a, yeah. a, a voracious reader of novels, but I don't, business books leave me quite cold, even my own. Um, so no, I mean, I think I had a few very dramatic creative directors at Ogilvy. Most of them were from a design background, not a copy. I had one great uh, creative director, Matt Rochford, who is a copywriter, who taught me little basics which seems so obvious now, like the rule of three and, you know, uh, problem agitate solution and, you know, using adjectives, you know, it's a big, uh, big thing. So you, you make the copy big and then it's a small, just stupid little things that stuck with me. Um, but no, no, like great one line. I remember one creative director was obsessed with The Economist and he used to try and he was always running these competitions to write the headline. That would go on the front page of the economist and i always lost um, and a, a friend of mine barry seppings always won and i remember just loathing barry seppings being so jealous of him um, and then rather lovely he actually came and did my course last year barry seppings and it was a bit of a it was a wonderful moment for me because i saw his name pop up and i was like it can't be the barry seppings it was and of course he's a lovely lovely man i was just very bitter and jealous so no no i'm waffling again but no big lesson just lots of kind of big personalities with big ideas and I guess a little bit of that rubs off on you over the years. Yeah it makes makes a lot of sense I think I I tend to agree on that and I think that again in advertising there, there are so many of those really simple rules that you 
that you get to know. I mean, even if it's just, <laughs> I, I remember one of my, there was a, one of my first bosses was a guy called Gavin Levinson. He was just obsessed with presentations as well. So everything had to be aligned and, you know, don't, don't use more than two or three different fonts for a presentation. I mean, ideally one, like there's all, like, all these kind of things, but they're, they're gold dust uh, when you when you end up having to present something to someone. Um, and so, so it's, yeah, so helpful, but um, I mean, you, you've actually gone on to, to teach lots of stuff yourself. So I'm imagining now, is it, are you still doing, um, you know, what's the sort of percentage <laughs> split roughly? Is it mostly now teaching in courses or are you still doing um, lots of the actual work yourself? So I think, you know, I've been doing this now 17 years. I think for the first four years, I was solidly copywriting um, yeah. for clients. And then about year five, which obviously coincided with my son going to school, that's when I started to branch out and do a bit of training. I was mostly live workshops. Yeah. But, and then back then, you know, now courses are two a penny, but back then there were no yeah. online courses, especially not in SEO. So I built them then. And for a brief period, I did both clients and that stuff. And it was very hard. It was really challenging. Yeah. But I haven't really had any proper copywriting clients for about four years now. Uh, last year, I did two projects uh, with a coffee company and an emigration lawyer, both amazing, Part, mostly just because I really like the people and also yeah. because I wanted to keep my hand in. I run a big community of copywriters and you get the further you get away from copywriting, you forget all the little horrors of, you know, that that when you've told the clients use track changes and then they send the debt back with a scrawl on it faxed back you know and I just showed this to my wife she writes the school newsletter and she thinks she shouldn't have used but in this sentence you know that kind of stuff I needed yeah. to feel that again uh, so that I could help my members a bit more so two clients in the last four years and then the rest is just mm -hmm. writing for myself yeah, and tell, tell me more about the the SEO copywriting course as well because I mean that when when, when I was doing some research before the show, that one came up a lot everywhere. So, I mean, you've obviously, the, the name of the course uh, uh, lives true in that it came up uh, a lot on, on searches. So, um, yeah, I mean, is that, I'm imagining that must have skyrocketed over sort of COVID times with people starting their own businesses and things. So. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a holistic course. It's not just copywriting. Because I think the problem with a lot of copywriting courses is they teach the SEO copywriting portion in a vacuum. And just like you can't out-exercise bad nutrition, you can't outwrite bad SEO. So you really, as a copywriter, need to understand the tech stuff, the backlinks, the keyword research, even if all you're doing is the copy. Because, you know, otherwise you can't set client expectations. You know, they're coming to you saying, I want to write 20 blogs to help with my Google. And then you look at their site, it's taking 15 minutes to load. And you're like, no amount of blogs is going to save you. Okay. <laughs> so... Yeah, I mean, I started that in 2016. We just closed the launch again with 23rd launch. We just did. So it's big. We've had about nearly 1,300 people through that big course. And then I've got lots of little courses. I've got like a 10-day challenge and a free course, called, foolishly called SEO Nibbles, um, which I've always <laughs> said nipples instead. So throughout every video, I say nipple and then try and correct myself. And by the end, I just give up correcting myself. So... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, that for me was a huge, a huge money and a very stressful thing to produce now, not so much. But yeah, I, I, I really enjoy that course. It challenges me trying to break down really complex ideas into the most basic form that you're, anybody can get. You know, somebody that barely even knows what a web browser is can get it. And um, that's a real intellectual challenge for me. And I love that. Yeah, and it's it's. What I love, what I loved uh, when I was going through it as well, was the the fact that you do them all um, live. So they're not. Uh, it seems like this yeah. is obviously. I'm sure there's parts of it which are on demand, but that that it's it's the, there's a good helping hand with it, um, which I think yeah. is hard to find from someone your caliber. And they're, they're actually really reasonably priced. So you should probably double your prices. <laughs> oh, you should. But I think you know a good course lives or dies often by the support. Uh, yeah. You need someone whipping your butt to make you finish it and you know seo is not i'm not going to say copywriting is easy but seo you know you, you do all the things you follow all the steps and just on your step 13 your your side does something different and there's no rhyme or reason to it because you did this back in 2017 and that affected this and blah 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 so the ability to ask someone 
questions is so much more important you know like it's you need to be able to bounce ideas off people and play around with it so yeah i do love the supportive version i have unsupportive courses i have evergreen courses but that one it would just be too hard to go it alone i think yeah and no, it makes sense i think different you know even with our platform we've tried to make it um you know as, as brilliant as we can and and we've got super high completion rates but i know that there are some subjects that we wouldn't dare to try and teach um, because we just wouldn't it just it doesn't fit it so i think um it, it's good to know that there's you know, it's interesting with learning there's no one style that's correct is there it's always everyone learns in a different way so it's always a bit bit hard and i think that that goes the same for the different topics which is interesting um yeah, exactly. and uh, the other thing which is uh which i love from you is you've got three podcasts um i don't know whether all three are still running though um no i had three podcasts i had a copywriting one an seo one and then my personal hmm. one the copywriting one was the hot copy podcast it's it's ended now we're gonna do like random episodes when we feel like it but it's yeah. done that was it's three years though we, we yeah, got a lot of yeah, um, we learned a lot doing that. The SA, what, SEO one is still going, and it's one of the biggest drivers for me for new customers. I think mm -hmm. it's very hard. You either love someone or hate them after listening to their podcast for half an hour. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people hate me, but a lot of people seem to like it too. Right. And yeah. I'm hoping to resurrect the Kate Tune podcast um, because I kind of have evolved. You know, I'm not, I'm not a, really a true copywriter anymore. I feel a little bit of a charlatan, Chris. I'm a writer at heart, but... I, I'm not a working copywriter anymore. So the K2 podcast, I hope, can talk to all aspects of what I do now. It's been such an evolution, you know? Yeah. So um, hopefully somebody will be interested in hearing about that. I'm 100% sure they would. I mean, you, well, your, your journey is just so interesting. And you, you know, because you've got a little team around you now. Um, yes. And I'm, I'm assuming it wasn't always that way. Um, yeah. I mean, how... Were there, what were some of the tough things that you had to overcome that helped you get to where you are now um, with the think, business side of things? I think the team thing is a great one to touch on. So I think as copywriters, we can be slightly martyry and think we have to do it all on our own. And also we're always, you know, if, we, if, we, if, if we're not really good with money and cash flow, we can always be in this feast and famine you know, roller coaster, and therefore the idea of actually paying someone to help us in our businesses just seems ludicrous. You know, like, well, I can barely pay myself. What are you talking about? And um, so I started very gently with just a VA virtual assistant for like an hour a week. And I didn't exactly know what that person was going to do. But the thing is, once you get someone in your business, if they're smart, they see what they need to do. They're like, oh, you know, why are you wasting your time reconciling your zero account? Or, you know, I could do that in 20 minutes. You could be working. You know, why are you doing this bizarre process to onboard clients when really you could just do this and this? So bringing someone else in and getting that perspective was so useful for me. And I mean, I've always had a proofreader in my back pocket because I'm appalling at spelling and grammar and I make so many typos so I've always had a proofread of that it gave me so much confidence again another you know like it's in agency you're working with loads of other creatives yeah. and then suddenly you go to working on your own you've got to think of all the ideas you've got to proof your work edit your work write the work be an accountant be a marketeer be a business manager a project manager an account handler it it's a lot yeah. so you know, as soon as I had a little bit of money, I started to try finding people who were better suited to those roles. And now I have 13 people, uh, not nervous. full time, not yeah. full time, obviously, <laughs> but, uh, you know, bits and bobs of people. They do their area of expertise. Like I've got someone who helps me with videos. I can make a video, but it would take me three hours to do what he does yeah. in 10. Um, and I'm about to hire a full time business manager, which feels exceedingly grown up on a very meaty salary that actually terrifies me. But um, it's, uh, the business, I just need to be brave. I'm very British and I'm very Northern English and I don't like spending money. That's a huge sweeping generalization, but it's about myself. So I feel I'm able to say it. But I've just realized that I can't have the kind of business I want unless I'm willing to take a bit of risk and invest in people. Yeah. That, that was a ramble, but I hope it made sense. <laughs> it, 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 make, it makes perfect sense. I mean, we're, we're yeah, we've, we've with with our company it's kind of the same I and mean, we've been going for five six years now and whenever we can afford to hire someone new and we get a little bit more money and it inevitably goes on on people um i think it you know you 
you're right like when you're at an agency I, I used to you know if I had a presentation I'd go to someone else and go oh Magnus can you just have a look at this and you but when you're running your own business you you can maybe get away with doing that once or twice phoning an old friend but you can't do that sustainably so you need to surround yourself with other people that that can do things and um it, it's always interesting trying to figure out what the next hire needs to be because I think when you're in a small business particularly there's <laughs> there's a million jobs it's like which one's yeah. going to be most important and has has a lot of that I guess been guided by the projects that you've chosen to to focus or concentrate on or, no or... really I'm the person that will take on the projects and then work out how <clears throat> to afterwards you know I, yeah. I look at my strengths and my weaknesses you know the, the, the early hires were I should have mentioned this before the VA obviously I, I, had, I had an accountant I was never going to do my own tax yeah. I'm not good yeah. because so. Um, and then you know someone to set up my zero and be a bookkeeper that was huge so I'm not good with I'm better with money but it's not doesn't come naturally to me so mm -hmm. that was a strength I didn't have outsource it you know I the only thing I would never really outsource is the actual writing uh, that to me would feel very disingenuous so every post I write every social media thing is is me because I, that's my core skill it would actually it pains me some I have hired copywriters to write for me and they tend to do this kind of almost cabaret version of me you know like the extreme yeah. uh, like they're doing the impression and you amp it all up or a caricature so uh, that's the only thing I wouldn't do but generally I look at my weaknesses and try and fill those weaknesses uh, and then just get people who who are smarter than me, to be honest, which is not that hard. Um, you know, I'm a great project manager, but my new business manager is far superior, you know, uh, because she's single minded. And I, I am very I am like a little bit of a squirrel. You know, I run after whatever nut I'm excited about. I'm better than I used to be, but I don't want to lose that squirrely nature. I don't want to stamp that out by becoming a business manager. You know, I, I now. <laughs> Uh, it sounds after me bagging out creative directors chris at the beginning of the episode i am now the creative director of my company that's the role that i've given myself that's the title so yeah. i get to i'm the talent i do the writing i do the showing up the podcast the speaking the live chats the whatever and other people behind the scenes make the wheels turn and that's that's a great place to be in to be honest uh, i'd imagine that your squirreling and finding all these different things actually help you to to be the incredible person you are and that you know that the you know my I strongly believe that that knowing a little about a lot is is really helpful and I think it, it allows you to be much more creative and do whatever it is that you're doing much better um, I love so, that you say that because I've always felt that that was such a weakness you know like why wasn't I born with one great skill why am I an amazing swimmer or violinist or mathematician and I'm not I'm a generalist yeah. you know I'm okay at quite a lot of things and I used to think that was terrible but I agree with you now it, it, it's really helpful in life I'd, to be able to do a few different things you know yeah no, my my guess though is that that I because I always thought the same as you but I think that this is a realization in the last kind of 10 years mainly thanks to the internet is that you don't necessarily need to be a specialist anymore um yes. I, I and there, there was in it was, i whenever i say that i always think in the back of my head oh but of course if you're a doctor you need to be a specialist but even with that there's so much research that shows that if you you know doctors who are trying to find cancers if they were more of a generalist they often found uh different found the cancers much faster or or just identified them where the specialist would often overlook them um, but, yeah that tunnel vision that you get i think you know <clears throat> I think that's true and as a copywriter there's, all, there's often a lot of pressure to niche right. um which can be i think super helpful you know you niche into medical writing then your marketing gets easier your job process get easier you're writing the same kinds of copy you get faster um but i think you should always keep a little bit of time up your sleeve to write a video script for a vet you know or to write uh you know some facebook ads for a clown you know no not clowns clowns are terrifying but you know what i mean like i never really niched by uh by industry I kind yeah. of niched a bit by SEO because back then it was a niche I don't think it is anymore but I, that that variation is what feeds my soul and every time I got like a big retainer client I remember I worked for a big tech brand for a long time writing their emails and I just kept putting the price up 
because I hated it. And they kept on being willing to pay the price. And after, you know, it was such good money that paid my mortgage, it paid everything. And after a year and a half, I just could not do it anymore. And I fired the client because I felt like I was just moving adjectives around in sentences. It was just soul destroying. So I think, you know, being too much of a specialist can lead to a bit of tunnel vision and a bit of tedium for me anyway, my yeah. personality. I 100% agree. I mean, if, if I know this is slightly different to where we were going, but I mean, who are your kind of, who are the copywriters that you admire the most? Um, you know, I'm not somebody that's sat down and written out Bob Bly's sales letters by hand for six years, which is often recommended. You know, I think it's other people like me. You know, we mentioned uh, Vicky Ross. But we're going to be we're going to be mortified if we've got that name wrong. I love Joanna Weave over in the States. I think she's uh, I love what she's done with her business and the courses that she has. And she's just a lovely, lovely uh, human. Um uh, there's a few, I'm not going to remember any of their names. Uh, I met a lot of lovely copywriters when I went over to an event called um, TCC IRL, which is an American copywriting conference. Right. Um, they all knew each other and they're all big names, but obviously I'm English. I don't know who any of them are, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah. So I'm not somebody that puts copywriters on a pedestal. You know, some of my favorite copywriters are actually members of my community who uh, there's a great copywriter in my community called Debbie Commode, who does these amazing reels on Instagram. Hilarious. I don't know how she, you know, she's not like some 21 year old millennial. She's my age. And so she's somebody I really admire. What Do you know what I mean? Oh, I, I won't be able to find it now. I'm going to have to find it on my phone. Talk amongst okay. yourself. We'll, we, we'll, we'll <laughs> edit the break. <laughs> I think it might be coffee spray. Let me I'm going to look it up. Can you play some elevator music while I uh, yeah. uh, do, do this? <laughs> I'll find it. I'll find it in a minute. Um, but yes, you know, so I don't think I have heroes and I definitely have no uh, reverence for, uh, you know, the old school, the Don Drapers, uh, the Mad Men at all, um, and unfortunately. But yeah. <laughs> It's different, you know, people inspire me for different things and often yeah. it's not big, big names. I think that's what I'm trying to say in a very yeah. roundabout. <laughs> no, it, make, it makes sense in your, <clears throat> sorry, your community thing sound amazing. I remember you, I think it was in one of the last podcasts I was listening to, you said that there was a chap who came up with a points-based priority system. Oh, yes. Which um, I thought sounded genius. And probably is yeah. very helpful for anyone who struggles with time management, which I, I know I do. Trust yes. Me. And of course, now I've immediately forgot his name. I'm going to suggest to Chris that after the episode, I send his name and the other name. We'll put them in the episode notes. because my brain. <laughs> But yes, your community, we talked about like that support and not having yeah. a team. I started the Clever Copywriting School nine-ish years ago on Google Plus, and that still existed. Wow. I was just so lonely and I didn't know what I was doing and I randomly asked 25 people on Twitter who I didn't know if they would join about 10 of them said no and about 15 said yes and that little gang taught me more about copywriting than I could have ever learned from a course even basic stuff like how to bill like should you send first payment you know 50% up front and I didn't even know stuff like that what a retainer was because I knew how to write copy I'd been in an agency but I knew nothing about running a business and that translated into the clever copy writing school now i've got about 400 members and i wanted it to be the community i wish i'd had when i started mm. so you know yes that was one particular session we did on productivity and not beating yourself up but and it was amazing um but yeah i love that community i get as much out of that community as i give it's for me really it's all about me to be honest and if, uh, if if people want to uh, want to join the community, how do they? Um, you have to take the course in order to join the community. No, 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 it's a separate beast. So it's not a course, and I think there's a big difference there. I found the lady's handle. Sorry, yes. I've been trying. To Brilliant. It's the underscore copy underscore sprite. Uh, the copy sprite with underscores in it. So uh, <laughs> I'll send Chris a link. She's great. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, so it's called the Clever Copywriting School. It's a membership. Um, and it's got loads of teachings in it. There's about 200 hours of training, but it's not a course. So it's more like a pick and mix. Remember when we had pick and mix at Woolworths? Yep. Woolworths on now, right? Woolworths. Unless you're in South Africa. Still here in Australia as well, yep. but it's like a, it's a supermarket here. It's not Woolworths yeah. as we know it. In, in South mix. Africa, it's like Waitrose. <laughs> is it? Yeah. And then they have, uh, I think they co-own Country Road, which is also an Australian brand. 
Yeah, it is, it is. Um, yeah, so no, the membership is amazing. Um, and uh, join, there you go, there's my pitch. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. such a <laughs> so, so to, to, to get into, to get become a member of that, you just go to katetune.com and then... Yeah, go there and then you can follow the journey. I've got about eight different websites, which was a foolish thing I did in the early years. Because I, I tell you though, that was a confidence thing. I started Clever Copywriting School and I was like, no one's gonna wanna learn copywriting from me. So I'm gonna pretend that this is this glorious, you know, company that runs copywriting training. And then I started the recipe for SEO success. And I was like, no one's gonna wanna learn SEO from me. And now I realize that it's the me that people are really buying. You can learn SEO on Udemy if you want yeah. to. Is it Udemy or Udemy? I never know. But and and, and, oh, and everyone don't do it. <laughs> exactly. But you know, you've got your amazing copywriting course. And I'm gonna I've got a few copywriting courses. And you could be like, oh God, well, are we in massive competition? No, because someone's gonna love your vibe and the way you teach and your wee wee tests and your little things that you've got. And someone's gonna love mine. Someone mm -hmm. said to me the other day when they joined my course, I was looking at someone else's SEO course, but I just really hated her voice. And I thought I can't sit through videos with this woman's <laughs> voice. Now fantastic i find my voice super annoying but you know. <laughs> <laughs> i'm it's, sure your, your apps that you write i mean it's probably like in in the real world you know if you if you want to start a restaurant the best location is probably near a bunch of other restaurants and yeah. i think people get far too hung up on competition and uh and jealousy and things that oh, have no good purpose <laughs> whatsoever yeah, I, um, I have literally wasted months at a time being jealous worrying about copycats worrying about competition feeling not good enough measuring myself against their successes months i've wasted so mm. much navel gazing ridiculous um and still now on a bad day i can go down the rabbit hole of looking at what someone else is doing and get quite bleak about it it's just who i am i'm bleak mm. I'm, you know I, I liked the smiths as a child it's it's in me but um yeah it's it was such a waste of time such a waste yeah. of time yeah but I, I think it's, I mean, my, my thing is the more you share, the more you win. And I think you do that so much with everything that I've seen in your life. And I, I can only see it's made you better for it. You've, you know, you've got an amazing, uh, amazing son now. Your parents are yeah. coming over to come and visit finally after a three year break. Uh, yeah. Business is going well. And what, what are the, some of the big things this year that you're looking forward to with, you know, apart from the parents coming over? Well, the parents coming over is both exciting and terrifying, but no, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to speaking again. Um, the, the, Australia's opening up a little bit, so I'm off to a place called Wagga Wagga to yes. speak there. Wagga, I'm speaking love it. Yeah, uh, I'm speaking at a conference next week. Um, uh, you know, I'm excited to get out and meet people again. I'm an ambivert, so I enjoy that. And then I enjoy hiding in my hotel room for like two days to recover. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm finally launching some of my own copywriting courses, which is bizarre. So I did the membership first and now I'm doing the courses. Most people do it the other way around. So I'm looking forward to launching some of those, even though the you know how much hard work it is putting mm. a course together. And then I'm hoping to finish my next book, uh, which is all about trying to be a, a good, a good person in business you know being ethical good etiquette you know how to be good in this crazy online world where everyone's a troll and and people are cruel um how to not let that get in so i'm really excited about that I, I, you know i'm a frustrated author chris i just really want to run away and write romance novels but um until i do i'll i'll get my kicks with writing business books is that so mills and boons next uh... maybe yeah i'm thinking well, I, I like i want to do historical I don't know. I've, I've, I've got lots of ideas. I'm giving myself another five years and then I might pack it all in and go and live in a hut and write my books. Nice. That sounds amazing. I'd love yeah. to live in a hut and write books. With a stand up desk. Everybody, yeah. Chris, just put a stand up desk. So. Yes. <laughs> don't look at the floor behind me. The <laughs> <laughs> podcast mess. wise can change when you stand up, apparently. You'll be I'd, more. Well, I hope so. Yeah, it was, uh, a, for me, it was just more, more uh, a health. Thing. I think it's so yeah. much healthier. Uh, I find so much the, sitting the, down the, all day. That you put under your desk so you can not only stand, but you can walk as you. I've, I've, uh, I haven't got the treadmill, but what I did buy is, is a um, something with uneven. It's an uneven surface sort of thing, so it's got pebbles and things inside it. So. It... <laughs> what next? Are you going to sit on a spike? I'll let you know how it goes.
<laughs> hopefully I'm still here in a few months time having uh, had a fall or something um yeah. but uh what what uh when's the book coming out roughly or do you is that sort of... right, Chris. no it's good I've signed <laughs> up with a, with a publisher like a co co-publisher um so I've given my, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of work on that like May June July it's all written you know like it's in my head it's a lot of collections of things that I've already written I'm a, I'm a prolific producer of thoughtful social media posts so a lot of them the chapter is going to be expansions of those you know like it, so um I, I hope this year it will be this year there I've said it I will yeah. do it brilliant okay <laughs> fantastic well I can't wait and but you do have a brilliant book out already if anyone uh, if anyone can't wait for the oh, undetermined okay. time <laughs> yeah it's called confessions of a misfit entrepreneur how to do how to uh, how to succeed in business despite yourself so it's a, a bit of a self-help business book on, you know, overcoming things like imposter syndrome and being too emotional and comparisonitis and all that kind of stuff. It was a cathartic book, really written entirely for myself, but it's a hopefully a lot of fun. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. As I saw uh, the reviews and I've ordered a copy. So oh, <laughs> oh, Chris, I would have sent you one. I would have sent oh. you five. No, no, don't worry. <laughs> it's an honor. Um I uh, I actually don't know where I'm going to go from here. I had so many things. I mean, basically, you you've won a, every award known to mankind, uh, as far as I know. Uh, you because you, you were voted Australian Businesswoman of the Year, right? Oh, uh, that was so. I've never earned any awards because I'm not really a winner of things. And then <laughs> I won that. It was devastating, nice. Chris. It was during COVID, so I didn't even get to like wear a fancy outfit and kind of you know like it's probably the one thing I'm ever going to win and I didn't get to go and pick it up it was great I, I, and people really seemed to sort of take me a bit more seriously when I won that I, I'm not a big believer in awards yeah. but it's amazing how what the impression they give on to other people you know a hundred percent I think it's like a you know the the I used to be in the wine industry years ago and um one of the best things we did was just put a fake sticker on the bottle saying uh, our favorite wine like we actually had fun with the copy on it and uh, so that we weren't pretending that we actually won an award but it looked like an award badge and just putting that badge on there with some fun copy helped us push more wine than anything else that we did um, many people love a logo they love a stamp they love yeah. like that circle with the wiggly edges around it whack that on something and it's like you're official now it's crazy 100 so, yeah. <laughs> uh, crazy what's the sign there is a sign behind you which i can't quite read it says australian oh that's for copycon that's for copycon yeah. so um i run a conference here in australia called the copywriting conference there's also a copycon in the uk as well we kind of battle for the title of copycon in a friendly way um so i don't think we're competing with each other to be honest so it's all good uh so yes i've had to put it off for the last couple of years obviously due to some i think there's a pandemic going on i'm not sure if you've heard about it but yeah anyway. some, someone ate a bat yeah yeah uh so hopefully this year in october that'll be happening again probably a lot smaller i think people are still very nervous about being out and about um but it's a it's a great fun event it's like it's like an ed cheer and contest concert with writers and fewer ginger people but um it's very <laughs> fun and uh I'm, I'm really looking forward to meeting because that's from, uh, primarily for my members but we do get yeah. real people in as well um so it's just lovely to meet everybody in in real life Oh, that sounds fantastic. And where and if, if people want to go, um, they need to get on a plane and go to Sydney. <laughs> Sydney, Australia. It's an amazing yeah. venue, actually. It looks out over Sydney Harbour Bridge. And um, we have a big party in the evening looking out over the bridge and the water. So mm. I think people just come for the party, to be honest. So. And what what uh, what date, roughly? Uh, I should know this, shouldn't I? It's in October at some point. I haven't okay. thought about it. Fuck this, we've got the speakers, the sales pages up if you go to CopyCon com.au you can check it out and if you do fancy a trip to australia we'd love to see you just mention chris and i'll give you a discount on your ticket <laughs> thanks it's, it's uh, it sounds amazing well look i'll i'll um i'll kind of probably draw it draw it to an end here because i think otherwise um you know i need to go to bed sometime soon and you probably yeah, need to do some work um, but i have a i have a i have a stupid question for you um okay. it's a would you rather uh, so would you rather live in a world where you always dance instead of walking or you always have to sing instead of talking? Oh, so definitely. Rather... 
definitely, definitely sing. sing. I sing all the time. I sing a lot to my dog. So, you know, and also I'm the sort of person who goes, I am opening the fridge to get the milk out. <laughs> like I'm in some terrible musical. So no, definitely singing. Yeah. Brilliant. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I love that answer. <laughs> there was there was no hesitation. It's like, yeah, definitely. Right. <laughs> these are the questions I lay awake at night and think about, Chris. You know, right. I think it's important to know these things. Like what superpower, what would you spend a million dollars on? Which famous person in history? You've got to know the answers to these things. What, what, what was your superpower? Uh, I think it would be uh, mind reading. I think it would be very dark. I'd have to be able to switch it off, but I'd love to be able to read people's minds. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's uh, it's my evil That's quite hard. <laughs> All right. You bet you would that now. Uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Well, well done. Nice. Um, I think that's kind of it. Look, Thank you so much. And please, if anyone uh, if anyone wants to learn more, just go to katetoon.com and you can browse any of her 50,000 websites with the, uh, with the 20 million other things that she's that she's doing. But um, yeah, I mean, the, we get to meet so many people when we're making these courses and I always feel so honored when we do it. But really, Kate, like having chats with you when we made that copywriting course was one of the highlights of my year like thank you so oh. much really 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 enjoyed it um and yeah your the way that you teach and the way that you share knowledge with humor um i just absolutely adore so thank you very much for being here and i wish you all the oh success God. and happiness and all the good things in the world um, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me um i'll get back to making my desk um, <laughs> lots of love and, and thank you so much.